Hi there. Hello. Hi, how are you, Mr. Singh? How are you? Oh, thank you for calling me on Saturday and uh, I welcome you to ask any questions. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, I'm talking with Tina uh, Gumashin and she is a lawyer, US immigration lawyer in Los Angeles. Uh, and she handles a variety of cases. Tina, why don't you Correct. introduce yes. us and uh, tell us what kind of cases do you do, you do in the US immigration? So I'm an immigration lawyer in the US, um, immigration is federal law, so I take clients from all 50 states. Um, and I do mainly business immigration and family immigration, so people that are coming to invest in the US or obtain an employment green card, and also people for family immigration, people that are getting married or engaged. Um, that's my, my specialty to help people in those areas. Yeah. Do you also help people who are... Uh, um, in in US uh, who have um, uh, you know expired their visas overstayed their the visas I94 I do yes I do a lot of I601A applications um, which are waiver applications for people who have overstayed their visa um, and have ended up getting married to a US citizen uh, or sometimes they even have a US citizen parent and they are able to obtain an I601A waiver which waives the ban from them being banned from the US and they're able to go overseas, get their, their green card at the consulate and come back on green card status. So as I as I understand, this waiver is uh, for a unique and exceptional circumstances like marriage to a US citizen or a family member. Uh, what about those people who do not have these family relatives as US citizen? What about the waiver to them? There is no waiver at this time for people that do not have um, a U.S. citizen spouse or a U.S. citizen parent or green card holder um, spouse or parent. Um, it's, it is a difficult situation for people that have overstayed or have even entered illegally um, and unfortunately don't have the option to use the I-601A waiver. That is that's something that hopefully will be resolved. I know the Biden administration have been doing a lot of changes, especially in Congress, trying to make changes for those people in, in a situation like that. I get a lot of inquiries. As, as you know, I deal with Canada immigration, but I uh, routinely get inquiries for people who are looking to go to US. Um, and I have some questions. If, if you are ready, then I can ask you those questions on their behalf. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, one of the questions uh, is from a Canadian uh, citizen, uh, Canadian citizen who are, in, um, who are in Canada. They are running their own business. If they have to uh, invest some money in US, how much minimum money they should invest and what is the procedure? So it depends on what their intent is. If they have a non-immigrant intent, meaning they don't intend to permanently live in the US, they just want to run a business there and start up a business, that would be known as the E2 visa. Um, and Canada is a treaty country. It has to be a treaty country, which Canada is to the US. And therefore, the minimum investment amount would be $100,000. Now, there's no set amount by law, but it's been interpreted around 100000 But that does vary depending on the state that you're in. For example, if you're investing in Vegas and Nevada or somewhere like Arizona, it could be less. And also the business that you're opening. Um, but it's around $100,000 on, on average for them to invest for an E2 visa. If, however, their intent is an immigrant intent, which is they want to live permanently in the US and get a green card, there's the EB-5 visa, which is now a 500 to 1 million investment. So nothing short, nothing less than 500,000, half a million US dollars, nothing, EB-5 requires- For EB-5, correct, yeah. yes. Now, now uh, what about people who are, uh, um, uh, are in in US uh, on a on they enter US on a valid uh, study visa or a B one B two, and then they overstayed. Now they are undocumented. They are illegal now. Uh, can they, if they have the money or if they can arrange the money, can they adjust the status to EB five by investing that money? Uh, no, unfortunately, if they've overstayed their visa. The law is that if you overstay beyond one hundred and eighty days. But less than a year, you're banned from the US for three years. If you overstay your visa beyond a year, you're banned for 10 years. And this is what is very common. I see a lot of people come on student visas or J1 internship visas and they overstay and they don't realize the severity of overstaying their visa. Um, and the only way around that at the moment is a waiver application. If um, And it happens many times where people end up marrying a US citizen, um, or often they might have a US citizen parent, where they're able to try and get the I-601A waiver approved. 
approved and waived that 10 year ban and obtain their green card at the consulate. Uh, if somebody who has overstayed his visa, but they, they entered US legally, uh, if they if they happen to have a US citizen spouse and then they get married uh, in US and later try to adjust their status, is it possible without leaving US to adjust to green card? No, it's not. Unfortunately, that's what the, the Biden administration right now are trying to resolve this issue. Um, however, the way that, it, that the I-601A waiver works is that, first of all, you have to file the I-130, which is the immediate relative petition based on your marriage. And once that's approved, the second stage is to do the I-601A waiver and get that approved. And once that's approved, you have to and you must go outside the US to your home country to get the green card at the embassy there. Um, now we do all the checks before someone leaves. It's really, really important to do all the checks, make sure there's no criminal backgrounds or criminal history. Um, I've heard some horror stories of when people leave, they don't get back. And that's because the lawyer hasn't done the appropriate checks to make sure everything's approved and there's no um, criminal background or reason for denial at the embassy. Uh, so when you talk about uh, uh, doing those checks, you're talking about uh, admissibility checks like police and medical and uh, previous lying or misrep or other, you know, previous immigration violations, if there are any, uh, just to, uh, you know, filter them out in advance. But they still have to be uh, possibly interviewed by the consular officer at that U.S. embassy to find out if the marriage is bona fide, is genuine or not, right? It is upon the discretion of the officer if they do find that the marriage uh, was not uh, genuine, then uh, the game over, right? Well, and most of the time the I-130 is approved inside the US. So USCIS, which is the body inside the US, they will do all those checks. They'll be asking you, you know, where's your rental agreement? Where's your joint health insurance? They'll be doing that check here. Um, the same with the I-61A waiver, which is to show that it would cause such extreme hardship on the citizen if this person were to be deported. So they, the USAS body, they do all those checks. The embassy, the, the consular officer, really just to check what you said is true. So they, they're going to interview you. They may ask you some brief questions as, as to some of the information you did disclose. Um, they might also look at your background check. And what I find is quite often with the embassies, they're really looking to see, are you an honest person? Um, I've had many clients go to the embassy and the embassy offers, officer has asked them, did you ever apply for a student visa or did you ever apply for this kind of visa? And they're just waiting. They already know. They have it on their computer. They, they already know the answer. They just want to see what's this person going to say? Are they an honest person or not? And so I always tell clients when you go to the embassy, always be honest. They want to see honesty. It's really important. So all uh, flash all your cards, nothing to hide, show what you got and everything and keep your open book life in front of them. But there's, <laughs> well, not exactly. There's a balance. I always say to people, you know, don't disclose more than necessary. You know, just answer the question asked, but never lie to, to an embassy officer. If they ask you a question, give them the appropriate honest answer. And usually with my firm, I coach and I guide my clients. So, you know, the kind of questions that they, they will be asked, depending on the visa they're going for and, you know, how to respond to that, you know, to keep their answers short and precise, almost like a job interview. You know, yeah. don't ramble on too much. If someone asks you a question, give them a precise, succinct answer. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I've got one more question also. Um, uh, if somebody has been charged uh, with uh, drunk driving, uh, in their country, uh, and um, are they admissible for any v U.S. visa? Can they apply for U.S. visa? Can they get it because they have a drunk driving charge in their country? It's very difficult, and I say this to people all the time. A lot of people say to me, well, I got my record expunged, and what people don't realize is with, is with immigration, even if you get it expunged, meaning that you get it almost, you know, off the record, if immigration find it, yeah. They're going to have an issue. So I always say to people, be honest about it. If you do have a DUI, be honest and do disclose it. It will be very difficult to get a visa. There is a high chance that, especially depending on the visa, if it's a non-immigrant visa like a B2, a visitor visa, or an E2, it will be denied. There's a much higher chance of denial. Um, now, with an immigrant visa, it's a bit different. If you've got a spouse and you've got a DUI, it can be argued. You can definitely try and, and, and argue it in that situation, but it makes the case more difficult. Yeah. Uh, conversely, if somebody somebody is in U.S. on a on a valid uh, status like you know uh, visa or a study visa, and if they are then uh, you know charged for a drunk driving or maybe like a drugs or something, then 
most likely they are removed and deported from US, right? There's no there's no chance of waiver. You can well, I mean, I've had many cases where you go into court and you fight it with the judge when they're in that removal process. Um and and but it's very difficult with I don't want to say to my clients, if you're wait if you're on a green card status and you're not a US citizen or you're on a, a non-immigrant visa, don't do anything stupid. Don't just don't take that risk. Get an Uber that night, call a friend. It's just not worth taking the risk because it will have implications on your visa. There's no doubt about that. Um, it makes future applications extremely difficult. And also your current immigration status is in jeopardy then. It's just not worth worth the risk. Yeah. yeah. All right, Tina, that's all the questions I have for today uh, for you well, regarding US immigration. Guys, look, uh, if you are facing some kind of problem or some inquiry, or if you're thinking about immigrating to US, US is the land of uh, opportunity, the Statue of Liberty is calling you, you know, uh, you should uh, contact Tina Gumashin uh, and I will post her email address down at the at the video. Um, you can email uh, her your situation, ask her a question and set up a time and so that sh she can resolve your uh, situation if you are in one. Thank you uh, so much. So and I know I have some questions for you. I have, I have a lot of clients that are also from Iran. Um, and, and they've been asking me a lot of times, um, what about Canada? And a lot of times I say to Iranians to come to America, it could be a bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult, um, where Canada seems to be a little bit more open. Is that true? Is Canada a bit more open than the US? What's the si situation with Canada? Well, that's that will likely uh, uh, generate a long answer, but to keep it short, uh, Canada is a true uh, immigrant nation. We have a quota, by the way. Uh, I don't. I know America does not have a quota. We have a quota of uh, bringing in at least uh, around, I think, one percent of our population new immigrants every year. It is divided into different categories like family class and economic class and refugee humanitarian class. Uh, so we we take in close to, and the quota is 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 growing every year. We take in close to one million new immigrants every three years. My one, goodness. One million new immigrants every three years. That's like new population increase. And I think I did not know that somebody told me just a few days ago that, uh, that the population of Canada is, is touching about 40 million or so. If I'm, I'm not wrong, I can check it again in Google. Uh, but when I came to Canada, it was around, um, I think 33 or 34 million. So within about uh, 14 year, 15 years now, it is it, it should be more than 40 million. So, so the population is growing. Uh, to replace our aging uh, segment of the population, we need fresh uh, young blood and uh, we have a point system. Point system is very uh, transparent, is a, is a very clear, a straightforward way of anybody to, to self-assess uh, online on the website to see. Let me just show you uh, if, I, if I may on the screen uh, so that uh, anybody who's watching, they can follow through. Let's see. Uh, so. Uh, let's see if I can show you. Can you see something on the screen? I can not yet. Oh, now I can. Yes. So this is this is our flagship uh, immigration program in in Canada called Immigrate Through Express Entry. The the emphasis on Express. It's a fast track process. If you have sufficient points, you can uh, come to Canada legally. Uh, getting that PR card, that PR status, like a green card status in less than one year. This is unprecedented. Oh. Any, anywhere in the world, whether you immigrate to England, to Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, whichever, you name any advanced OECD country in the world, there is absolutely no way based on your skills and education experience, you can immigrate to a top country like this in less than, less than one year. But Express Entry is our program uh, that most people uh, you know uh, choose to apply and this is how it is and the uh, website is very is this is a award winning website it's government of canada right on top how express entry works anybody can you know what documents you need and pretty much anybody can this is the you know this is the this uh, you know you see this 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 uh, lake is near my home by the way uh, oh, wow so, it's beautiful uh, so it's a it's a beautiful landscape this is i think is a summer but in winter it's pretty much all white <laughs> so oh, wow uh, very yeah. pretty so this is the express entry this is this is how most people will apply and this is how it goes so that's what the story of canada is and, and what about student visas for for people from iran what's the what's the situation with that 
what do you feel? I've got a lot of people from Iran. They ask me, can I get a student visa for Canada? Is it easy if I have a master's or a bachelor's degree from Iran? Am I able to get a student visa to enter Canada? What, what's Canada's policy like with students? Yeah, the student the student uh, visa is right here on the screen. So whatever I am whatever I am disclosing and whatever I'm mentioning, yeah, I will back it up with uh, with people uh, what they can do and on their own through this website. If you if you look at if you all you have to do is just go to Google and type this, and you will see you know uh, uh, let's let me just click here. So this is a this is a study uh, 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 study visa study permit portal here on the Government of Canada website. Uh, we take in close to about 600,000 students every year from all over the planet. Every year, by the way, uh, the half of the population of study comes from India and China, but Iran is not very far. I don't have the statistics how many people uh, are applying from Iran, uh, but uh, I think if I remember it well, uh, last year in 2020, there were close to about uh, 8,000 applications or so. But uh, just uh, remember, the approval rate for Iran is not that great. It is hovering around 50%. So 50% of the applications in different categories like post-secondary college diploma and university PhD, uh, typically 50% people will get refused and you know, other people will come here. So that's what it is. But um, you know, they can follow everything from here. Uh, this is uh, you know, uh, pretty much you can see what, what you need to make an application. Everything is online, by the way. So there's no need to uh, print a physical paper and submit to a, a office and something. I think your uh, clients, Turkey, uh, they go to Turkey and uh, the Canadian embassy in, in, uh, in Turkey takes all the applications for uh, for Iranian uh, region. So this is this is what it is. Uh, it takes close to I can show you how much time does it take for for a study. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. Yes. yes, it tells it tells you what is the typical processing time because of the COVID and other travel restriction. Now a new virus showing the uh, coming on the way to US and Canada. You know, it typically is about 13 weeks processing time. That's about, you know, uh, three months or so. So if you are coming for September session, which is next uh, fall, uh, you should be able to apply close to around, uh, you know, April or May. At the least, you can apply for the visa. That's that's how it is. So, uh, so that's that's the thing about student visa. Once they have the study, uh, once they uh, graduate from the program, then they apply what is called a post graduation work permit. What you call in US called OPT. Correct. Yes. Yes. We have a very similar thing. With, with so just just this is this is a equivalent of OPT. So you work uh, here uh, and through this, and uh, they uh, once you. Once you have at least one year of experience working in a, you know, like a skilled job, um, you are on the way to express entry and this Canadian experience class. So it's a very, uh, you know, established pathway towards PR. So when the students are coming from Iran, they know exactly what they have to do to achieve the PR status. That means, let's say, study for yes. two years and study for two years, work for uh, one year in that three year uh, postgraduate work permit period. So if you have uh, good English and other, uh, you know, education, of course, uh, and points for, uh, you know, maybe previous experience, uh, you will likely make the cutoff to be accepted under the express entry. And that's that's how. So typically all students, when they come here, if they're studying for a two year diploma at the least, uh, if not a degree, they will uh, become PR in about four to five years uh, from the first day of landing in Canada. Gosh, that's fast. That's really fast. That's, that's, a lot faster you, than the U.S. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. I, I, I keep I keep getting phone calls from students in U.S. They are from different countries where they are studying something and uh, they say, look, uh, uh, we can't get the green card here and we have to find an employer and stuff. And so and I say, look, uh, if you want to come to Canada, this is what you have to do. And this is how it is. Yeah, it's a great option, especially because I feel like Canada has got more procedures in place where it's a step-by-step -step process to become a student and then a, a permanent yeah. resident. I have, I, have, I have compared, I wrote an article about this actually, I have compared the US immigration system with Canada, you know, step-by-step -step based on different categories. And uh, one of the, one of the, you know, uh, essential uh, contrast between US and, and Canada is in US, everything is nebulous, it's a hazy. There is no structured path. For skilled people, I mean, yes, uh, if you are, have a job, you do a H-1B visa, then hopefully if your employer likes you, he files a Y-140. 
Uh, depending on the quota, maybe you're waiting for seven years, eight years, Indian people, 13 years, 14 years. We don't know how many years and uh, there's a long delay. Uh, but for students who cannot find that H-1B sponsorship, where do they go? There's no, there's no way it's for tough. Yeah, yes. I agree with you. At the yeah. end of being yeah. a student, you either have to get sponsored or, as you say, and and here's and here's the contrast in in Canada with this program. So in in Canada, if you if you have the OPT, which is the PG work permit, and if you have worked uh, because this is an open work permit, you are not tied to employer. You can work you you can work pretty much anywhere. You don't do not necessarily need a employer sponsorship to proceed to the PR. And that is a big difference between um, you know U.S. and Canada. So that's why Canada has a more uh, heart. It's magnanimous. It is op offering liberal options uh, for uh, students to you know proceed to PR, which is not uh, available in U.S. No, no, it's not. It's it's more difficult in the U.S. You have to find a company that's willing to sponsor you to offer you a job, whether that is like you say an H-1B or if you're Australian, it would be an E3. Um, and then eventually doing an I-140 petition, which is an immigrant visa petition. Um, but it's a lot more difficult from the size of things. It's more difficult in the U.S. To, compared to Canada, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. One, one of the one of the problems that I have with the H-1B system is so I can imagine that somebody who has a degree, if they want to study computer science or management, something they they may qualify for a skilled job which pays sixty thousand, eighty thousand dollars and above and they can get a good big employer. That's OK. But what about people who have come to U.S. to learn painting or maybe they are learning carpentry or maybe they are learning something which does not give that level yes, of quality, uh, does not require degree. But what about them? They have absolutely no way to proceed to green card. It's very uh, difficult. Yeah. But, but here I can compare uh, compare again with Canada is and I and I'm I'm from Canada, so I'm I'm talking about good things about Canada. Uh, uh, definitely. But it's, it's, it's worth uh, worth knowing. That let let us assume somebody from Iran comes to Canada Canada to study let's say uh, to how to become a chef you know maybe a kitchen or cooking or uh, pretty much anything you know uh, maybe how to do welding and you know small these are trade skills carpentry or something a house building concrete something and if they do a, like a one year diploma uh, and uh, they will get a one year uh, post graduation work permit and uh, that's all that's all is needed. There is no, there is no further employer sponsorship needed to proceed uh, to the to the to the PR status. So if they have uh, the 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 diploma and they have uh, job experience in that field, and if they are in the right age, they have the right language score, they are good to go. They 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 don't need to depend on any employer. So this is That's a fantastic. this is yeah. this, this great is, opportunity for them once they finish. Absolutely. To open up that door and, and eventually transition, whether that would be to permanent resident status in Canada or even onto another work visa in Canada, it's fantastic, fantastic system. So this is a this is a big difference in uh, how how the the people who have talent and skills, uh, if they cannot make it to uh, you know U.S. based on those uh, structured layers, uh, Canada Canada is welcoming them with open arms, and and that's that's how it is. Yes, and I think also when people get Canadian citizenship, it makes it a little bit easier coming to the U.S. in the future. It opens up that door if they can't get it right now. Um, you know, I've got many clients that are Iranian, and originally they want to come to the U.S., and, and many of them go to Canada instead. And then eventually in the future, sometimes they stay in Canada, sometimes they decide to move into the U.S., but it makes it, that transition a little bit easier. Yeah. Before you before you ask for more questions, let me just also present to you the value of the Canadian passport for the Iranian. Somebody who is from Iran uh, and um, uh, they are dreaming of immigrating and living abroad, uh, they must be asking, would I be better off uh, having a American passport or a Canadian passport, which has more power and value? I mean, think of this, uh, if they are uh, whatever relations, the political relations they have with the U.S. and so, and if they are from Iranian descent, and once they get a passport of, let's say, if U.S. or Canada, which one would give them more confidence and power and, you know, that that uh, mental solace yes. that when they go back to Iran, I mean, would they rather 
be there with the American passport. Hey, I have an American passport. But guys, look at this American passport. I've got an American passport. Or would they be better off with a non-American passport like Canadian, British or something? So uh, the, the, the Canadian passport is, uh, um, is as powerful as US, if not more. And in, in based on how visa exempt status of travel, they, they allow you to go to different countries. Uh, and uh, it's, it's second to none, by the way. Uh, and uh, of course, as you said, rightly so, that once once you once you have the Canadian passport, uh, which is what used to be called NAFTA, I think they changed their name last year uh, to something else, Mucosa or something. Uh, so based on that uh, occupation list, uh, certain occupation list, you if you have a job offer, you can just uh, get to the border and get the uh, NAFTA TN visa. It's called TN visa uh, right away. So that's another another advantage that you have. But I have discovered that many people do plan that, hey, look, let's go to Canada and then later on we can easily move to America. Once they're in Canada, they never want to go to America anymore. <laughs> That's true. I, I know there's a big um, Iranian population in Vancouver um, in British Columbia. I, I know I've got relatives there and I've got many, many friends there. Um, and there's a, a big, big community for, for Iranians and, and they love it in Canada. Um, Especially because, as you say, the, the structure for people coming as students or even immigrating um, for a job is a little bit easier than America. And what's it like for someone that wants to invest? Say, say someone's maybe older, they're in their 50s, they're, they're not a student anymore, they're in Iran and they've got a lot of savings. Can they invest in Canada? How, how would that work? How much money do they have? <laughs> <laughs> say they have maybe around 100,000. Yeah, 100,000 will not work. Uh, it may uh in some situation but i think it's, it's slightly low so what we have is uh, we have just like what you call california state or oregon state we call them provinces with like a british province so uh, we so our our provinces have their own uh business nomination system uh by which they can attract certain kind of entrepreneurs to live in that province so like british columbia i'm in alberta and so forth every province has a has a more or less uh, there are some essential, uh, you know, framework, but there are some key differences in what kind of businesses they are trying to attract and how much money. So, for example, let's take an example of uh, British Columbia. So they want uh, people to come and invest in their forestry and maybe they have some high tech program, uh, you know, IT skills and something. So th it's on the website. Uh, maybe this is the time I can show it to you on the screen if if I may just a glimpse on it. Just so the this is called a BC Provincial Nominee Program. Nominee means that the province is nominating you as an entrepreneur because you're bringing your skills and your money and stuff to uh, to come and you know benefit the benefit the uh, province. So uh, they have a certain way. You can start around two hundred fifty thousand dollars or so, depending on what what kind of business it is. And and uh, that's uh, that's how you can make a profile online profile and uh, give them a business plan, and then they will decide based on the strength of a business idea plus the capital and a variety of factors like metrics, how many jobs are being created, whether it's a critical sector or not, and that's how that's how they start. So everything is on a case by case basis. Money alone will not buy, it, just like you said in uh, uh, US five hundred thousand dollars. So money alone will not cut it. Uh, you need a combination of factors, so I can uh, show you on the screen. Can you see that on the screen? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Uh, let me just show you one more time. Uh, here. How about now? Nope, not yet. Not yet. Like, no, it's coming up as a blank, blank screen at the moment, or on my computer anyway. Maybe it's just on my end. Let me try. Let me try. I'm, I'm, I've, uh, you know, using the share button here, but if it's not, then there's a problem with me or my system. Let me just try it one more time, and let's see how it does work. Uh, okay. How about this one? Uh, how about now? Nope, nothing yet. Very strange. It's just coming up as a blank screen. Uh, let me just try it one more time, otherwise we'll let it go. Uh, Fourth time lucky. <laughs> yeah. Nothing? Nope, nothing yet. Okay, well, that's okay. We'll let it go. So uh, this is on the 
uh, British Columbia uh, website, uh, uh, and it's called BCPNP Pathway. There are different pathways listed there. One of them is Entrepreneur Immigration. Uh, so this is uh, everything is listed there. It tells you how much money to bring in, uh, close to about you know $250,000 and $350,000. You have to make a plan. You have to uh, send them your proposal. Uh, they will call you, um, you know, uh, even though they say eligible, you know, a lot of people who come to British Columbia, they're coming from uh, people who are rich in China and Hong Kong and other places. They are bringing in their million. On an average, they probably are bringing in million dollars plus uh, business investment. So uh, everything is on a on a uh, on like a merit system on which has the more uh, attractiveness uh, for the province to, you know, you, you're bringing you more money. Maybe you have a better idea, maybe better employment generation. So, so that's what uh, they, they do. But they select uh, on. OK. They, they select on the on the on the on the total score uh, on on the basis of this. So, but everything is on the website. So, if they uh, uh, if they present the proposal and the and the government provincial government likes it, likes it, and they will call you for a likely interview, uh, and that's it. And then they will decide whether we like your project. And and here you go. So they get nomination. Once you get the nomination, that means you are clear to come and open your business here. Uh, and uh, you can bring your family while you're waiting for your PR to happen. So in the in the background, your PR application is uh, is under process while you are uh, running your business, and they give you certain time, about two years, to show uh, that your business plan is actually working. Uh, so they make you sign an agreement. So that's how that's how it is. That's great. Yeah, that's that's a, a lot better than the EB5, which can take a, a lot longer. Unfortunately, it takes about at least three years for the first part to get approved. And then another two years you have to wait because you're on conditional status. And then for the final part right now, it's taking up to five years. It's almost a five to ten year process for an EB5. Yeah. Um, it's a much faster process for Canadians that, that are coming for people that are coming to Canada um, with an investment amount. Yeah, I did. I did some homework about EB-5. Uh, one of the demerits about EB-5 I discovered is that EB-5 program requires that you invest your money in some other project, some other project that you don't control. Uh, so if if somebody somebody else is running, like the you know the five hundred thousand, when you have a regional uh, program and you know uh, you are investing in somebody's hotel construction or land development or something, so you are you are pooling in your capital with somebody else and you don't control the enterprise somebody else does and whether or not it makes profit you have no access or you have no control over it that's a big uh, that's that a big a big uh, issue correct i mean that was for regional centers they've actually stopped that recently there's no applications for regional um congress didn't renew the law back in june 21 and so right now there's only direct investments which means investments that Fortunately, I think I agree with you. I think it's much better to control. Um, so right now they're only doing direct investments for EB-5 visas. But again, with EB-5s, you have to hire at least 10 US workers, um, which is a lot of people to have on payroll at one time, especially for the, the amount of time it takes to get the green card. You have to employ 10 people on payroll for at least that five to 10 year period until you get, get to the final stage, um, which a lot of people can find difficult. Unless you have a lot of money, you've, you've saved up and the business ideas, a franchise, I often tell people to invest in franchises because they have a better um, survival rate than your own brand new business. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not very attractive, especially I, I can imagine people who are in US right now, maybe they are under some other amnesty status or 81 scheme or saw agriculture program, or maybe they are on refugee claimants. They are waiting for their uh, asylum, uh, you know, pending applications. If they are if they are in the pending status for any any uh, program in US, and if they are running a small business, I mean, think of this, uh, and and uh, not asylum, but waiting for asylum interview. But they are running their own business. They are running the liquor store. They are running their 7-Eleven. Uh, they are running some small restaurant in US but they are unsure whether their application for asylum will go through or we do not know even how many years. I think if they are running a small business and if they have access to at least about 200,000 US dollars, uh, I would definitely advise them to consider Canada moving, relocating the business uh, and capital to Canada and getting uh, the, uh, the, the the PR. Uh, forget about, you know, you know withdraw your asylum application, say goodbye, and then, uh, you know, relocate your talent and, and capital to Canada and then take advantage of this of this thing. Because if you are running your small business in US, it's very 
uh, easy for us for the Canada immigration to check your your capital, your uh, 1040, your payroll, uh, your bank statement, or you know, I mean, there's hardly anything shady documents that you know we can from a different country. So yes. we can we can we can check your documents very quickly. We can assess you on your business uh, acumen, and uh, you you'll be you'll be in fast track to come to come to Canada. I I remember I did a case uh, a long time ago. Uh, there was a guy who was uh, pending status in a in a I think uh, asylum, but he was running a trucking. Uh, he had uh, you know a few trucks. So he was running I think four or five trucks, but his uh, his net worth was uh, over half a million dollars, and uh, his sales was I don't remember sales, but enough sales so that uh, we made a business plan to come uh, to set up a trucking company and a trucking distribution company in Manitoba in Winnipeg. And uh, they got an interview also. Uh, they got an interview call also, you know, after the business plan. But uh, for some reason, they changed their mind. They say, ah, ah, America is better or something. But they're still in America. They they didn't get it. And that was about 15 years ago. And yeah, they, and they, it takes a and long they, time. And, mm -hmm. and they could never get the green card. So by the, if they had taken that opportunity now, they would have become Canadian citizen three times over. Gosh, that's and that's the thing sometimes if one door closes, another one's open. With America, sometimes with asylum cases, it does take a really long time because the courts keep pushing back the date. And it can be years before your application is ever actually decided on. So it's a bit easier if you have that option to go to Canada that have a more straightforward process for people. That option is available for people. And I think sometimes people don't think about that or know that that option is there. So it's good that they know that that is something that they can do. That's right. That's right. Uh, what are the questions that you have for me uh, from Iranian uh, clients or Iran? Yes, I had a lot of people want to know about the student visa, which is great. You've covered that and, and PR people wanting permanent resident status. Um, let me just pull up some questions here that I have. Um, I, so one question someone had is, is if, if someone invests money for, for PR, permanent residency in Canada, are they able to bring their children? What's the age limit? In America, for example, it's children under 21. What is it in Canada? Is it the same? Or once children past 21, they cannot bring their family over? What are the, the rules in Canada? Yes, uh, the age, uh, the dependent age is 22, 22nd birthday and lower. So is this pretty much the same thing? Uh, if once they are doing a PNP applications, uh, they uh, uh, the main applicant and the spouse with the marriage certificate, the marriage spouse plus anybody, any children uh, who is less than 22nd birthday, right. they all they all get to accompany the principal applicant. Okay, and and what embassy um, would they be going to? Where's the embassy for for people from Iran wanting to go to Canada? Where would that where would that be located for them? If they are if they are primarily resident in Iran, if they are living there, they don't live in different second country, so their applications will be routed. Uh, once they get the PNP nomination, uh, if they are study visa or work visa, they it will go to the Turkey, which I showed you on the on the screen earlier. Right. So Ankara. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and what's the wait time roughly for someone that's wanting PR? What would the wait time be for, be for them on average? It all it all depends on the stream. As I said earlier about the Express Entry program, Express Entry is an online application system by which all the processing uh, gets done online. There's no office. You know the the central office in Canada. Uh, they they do all the processing, checking documents and verification and blah, all the police clearance and medicals and something. You wherever you are in Iran, you just. Uh, upload your police clearance certificate, you upload your medical certificate and those things, and that's it. So everything is done centralized from Canada. When the time comes to finalize the actual immigrant visa, uh, so they will uh, send that file. Uh, so let's say in, in Turkey, that's at the, at the very last end. And uh, and that's it. You'll get a letter that's you're done. Please submit your passport you know, nearby you, and then you go there. Uh, in, in Turkey, wherever that uh, deposit center is, you submit your passport and lo and behold, within about two weeks or so, you have the visa in your hand. Wow, fantastic. So it sounds like this is a really good option for people in Iran who sometimes want to come to America but can't or even go across to Europe. Canada is has some really good programs available for them, whether it's via the permanent resident status or the student visa. That's I might, I might, also, I might also add whether the people are from Iran or any other country. Let's let's take a situation about, uh, and I get this uh, routine question 
uh, very frequently and people still cannot believe that is true. Uh, so let us assume that somebody came to US on a study visa or a, or a employment authorization or anything. As, as long as they have entered uh, US legally, they have a valid I-94, even though it got overstayed, it got expired. As long as they have at least one year of legal presence in US, they, they can still apply for Canada immigration from US without leaving US for Iran or some other country. So this is a this is a uh, exciting news for people who would who do not trust to go back to home country because they don't want to be stuck and they may even leave uh, US uh, without knowing you know what benefits uh, they might get eventually. So if you are if somebody uh, uh, who is living in US uh, you know at least for one year legal uh, legally admitted uh, in US and after that, you fell through the cracks. You, you know, you know whatever happened. But if you have enough uh, points on PR on express entry, maybe you had a master's degree from your home country, and then uh, you had a one year of OPT here, and then you have some uh, recognizable uh, experience that we can combine from Iran and one year at least, and let's say in uh, in US, uh, combining that experience and your language skills and your master's degree, that can still qualify for you uh, express entry directly to Canada from from US never have to return back to your home country so that's, that's fantastic because I have to think about I have not, my my J1 expired or my F1 is expiring I've overstayed by six months I, I don't want to go back to Iran or I don't want to go back to the X country wherever they're from what do I do so that is a fantastic option for people in that situation to know that they can actually cross over to Canada if they have good good qualifications. OK, yeah, so that's 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 true for not only express entry, but uh, let's take one more example. Let's say somebody just like I said earlier about somebody who's uh, maybe a cook or a chef. Maybe he's a truck driver in, in California right now. Maybe he's he's driving long hours of truck and he has uh, asylum pending. Nothing is coming through. He's been uh, driving for three years, four years, five years. He has a valid uh, California driver license and a good driving track record. Uh, if he can find a job offer, a job offer from a sim, uh, from a, like a similar role uh, trucking company in Canada, he can say goodbye to U.S. and 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 directly fly with on a valid work visa from Los Angeles to to Canada, and that's it. He's done, and eventually he'll get the PR here. Great, great. That's something that a lot of people don't know in the U.S. that that option in Canada that Canada offer that for yeah. people. A lot of people think they're in asylum that. You know, if they're pending asylum status, they have to wait, wait it out. But that is an option for people to that's know cool. that they. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. So, uh, any more questions? And any, I I love any complex questions. Maybe somebody yes. has been somebody has been turned from the border, perhaps, or anything uh, they want to. For ask. most of the questions I, I have here is is um, a lot of my, my clients that are in Iran have been asking a lot of questions. They've been wanting to, to move um, and, and their questions are the, the student visa, the investment, PR and lastly, let me just pull this up here. Um, uh, what, so for family visas, I have someone asking, well, in America, for example, you can bring your immediate family, your mother, your spouse, your father, and children under 21. In Canada, is that the same policy? If someone gets married, are they able to bring their mother once they get permanent residence, or do they have to have Canadian citizenship? What would the situation be, be there? Yeah, so let's let's uh, let's look at separately, uh, you know, these these uh, these categories of families. Um, so. As as uh, as long as you are at least a PR, uh, PR and citizen both, so you can uh, marry a foreigner and bring as a spouse. So that's good. That's the same same as in as in US. Uh, to uh, to to sponsor the parents, like mother, father, and even grandparents. Uh, again, same thing, PR or citizenship. So uh, there's no there's no special. I know in US they have a special category for citizen as compared to green card holders. Are are yes. Our uh, our status of sponsorship is the same. Whether you have PR or citizenship is the same status. 
Oh, uh, fantastic. There's a big difference in the US. It's different because you cannot petition for your parents to come over unless you are a US citizen. And depending on how you got your green card, if you got it through work, you have to wait five years for citizenship. If you got it through marriage, you wait three years for citizenship. So you have to wait until you're a citizen before you can bring your parents. So so for people in Canada, that's very different. That makes it much yeah. faster. So so we we don't we don't have a we don't have a waiting system of any category. As soon as you are a PR, in fact, many people have as soon as they become a PR, right uh, day one and day day second, they are on to whatever they they want to sponsor, uh, if they have the income. And so, but because we require income uh, to sponsor parents, uh, parents and grandparents, uh, but to sponsor your spouse and your dependent child, maybe you have a child previously from a different marriage or so. Uh, there is no income requirement, so those can be done, uh, you know, uh, irrespective of the income. Now, there's one more visa which U.S. does not have, and uh, maybe I should show you on the screen if I am successful. Let me see, uh, my tricks of the Skype will work or not. Let me see if I can. Just a minute. I bet this visa does not exist in U.S. and it it probably never will. But uh, Canada is using this visa to empower families and uh, and bring families. Uh, here, let me just show, try to show you uh, if you can. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Maybe it's on my end. That I'm oh man, that's, uh, how is it not showing the screen? Let me just try it one more time. Otherwise, maybe we are doomed on this technology thing. Let's see if we can, uh, look at this guy. Um, Oh, I see it now. You see it now? Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, Skype. Thank you, Skype, for showing this. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is called, as you see, uh, parent and grandparent super visa. It's not a normal visa. It's called a super visa. Uh, oh, it has, super visa. Wow. It has more power and more punch into it. Uh, the way it works is that let us assume that if I, um, because our everything is in a quota for families for for parents. So if the quotas, I think right now it's twenty thousand or so. Uh, if if I if I do not uh, uh, get the, and this is like an online lottery system. If I if I if I'm not successful in getting uh, getting my slot for the my parents or grandparents. Uh, then what do I do? I apply for a super visa. Uh, uh, take a different situation. If I do not have enough income to justify that I can afford my parents to live here along with my other families, what do I do? I can go to something called a super visa. So super visa allows uh, the parents who are unable to be sponsored for PR to come here and live with me um, for uh, for up to two years at a row. So. So, so like you know, any uh, B one B two visa for US, you know, they give you six months stay, and similarly for Canada, they give you a six month stay. Uh, so, but uh, can you see on the screen? I can. Yes. Yes. Uh, instead of six months, a super visa lets you visit your child, children, or grandchildren for up to two years at a time. Ah. It's a multi entry visa that provides multiple entry. So that's that's this is yes. this is this is very unique to Canada. I do not know of any country. Uh, no, we don't have it in the US. No, as you say, we have the, the B2, which is granted for 10 years, and you're allowed to come in increments of six months. Um, unfortunately, that's that's how it is. They don't have an option like this for people to spend a long time. I mean, you can extend your B2 if you're inside the US. You can apply for a six-month extension, which would give you a year, but we don't have a two-year visa. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a two-year stay. You get it done ten year multiple, but you get a two-year authorized stay, like I ninety four, to to live uh, to, up to two years. And later on, people will keep on extending. By the way, so so to be eligible for the super visa, you must be parent or blah blah blah. You must have a letter. Uh, you must buy medical insurance for at least hundred thousand, which is a must. You know they must have medical coverage uh, for the parent, and that's it. Uh, and uh, the the approval the approval rate for super visa is very close to. The, the typical approval statistics for a regular tourist visa, depending on the country, is around, let's say for India, is around 60% uh, or so, but for super visa is close to 90 90%. So super visa is more or less uh, quite certainty that you will get it unless there's some problem. Uh, but super visa is fantastic for people who are 
who want to live with their parents and they, you know they want they don't want the parents to be left behind so this is this is That's very a fantastic unique. option yeah i've not seen that before for any other country and, and we don't have it in america we That's don't have right. that option here that's right. Now, did I also mention about Atlantic? Uh, can you see on the screen Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program? No, I haven't heard about this. What? Can you, can I you can see, see it? it, yes. Yeah. That's, that's right. So this is also Atlantic, the maritime provinces right on the east coast near the Atlantic Ocean, you know, uh, just to uh, bring more people to live there and settle there. The government uh, started this program, I think about two, uh, yeah, 217, how many years ago? 217 uh, to bring in more people. So employers uh, in that region, they can uh, bring in foreign staff to work there and nominate people depending on what skills they need. And once they are nominated, they can they can quickly, they can even bypass the express entry and, and get PR there. So this is another unique program in Canada. They are looking to fill in gaps where people don't like to live, not in the big cities. So this is Atlantic immigration program. There's another we have a we have a plethora of you know you know programs here for everybody. Look at this rural northern immigration pilot. Can you see on the screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is also so uh, all the places. Not all some place. I mean, they have a selected list of uh, cities where uh, uh, you know it's a rural uh, you know background where not many people live there. So if you have a job, if somebody has a job offer in that in that uh, program in that region, they can they can apply to this program and then they can they can apply there. You know, look at this international students, any international student who is actually studying in that region, in that college, uh, one of those or maybe I have a master's degree, uh, you know, uh, in the community for for uh, you were you were living in that community and with a master's degree. Uh, you you can apply with with a simple uh, language skill or so so this is uh, this is pretty much and it tells you where uh, this is the names of all those cities small cities wherever they are uh, that people can you know people in Iran can take a look hey do you want to live here why not if I want to live here maybe I can find a college or university in that region uh, so that yes. I can I can I can start and, and that easier. will uh, that will make it easier and faster and more uh, you know the more chances for them to eventually uh, to, to get the immigration if they are if they don't have a master's degree and PhDs and other you know uh, high level skills maybe they can uh, they will they they will know that they will not qualify into express entry so they can choose one of these smaller programs either this one or the Atlantic provinces so so Canada is doing uh, pretty much is is uh, pulling all stops to bring people in they want yes. people uh, they want people they want people to come and then. Uh, you know, and 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 fill in. Canada is a great uh, is a great landmass, and the population, as I said, is hardly 40 million. So they want more people to come here. Uh, let Absolutely. me just let me just check while I'm on it. So I don't want to be wrong. What is the population? Let me just ask Google. Popula yeah. Population of Canada. I, I don't want to be wrong, and you know, people say, oh, look, this guy doesn't know the population. What's the population? Oh, current population is 37.4 million. Maybe it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it is, it's it's going there. It's uh, I said uh, the uh, so it will be um, uh, you know it will be hardly 50 million by 270. So it's uh, 37 million. So sorry, I guys, I take it back. It's not 40 million. So it is, uh, but it's, it's going there as compared to going there. Yes, yeah. I think that's the, the biggest difference with Canada and the U.S. Canada seem to be offering visas for all different options of skills, whereas in the U.S. For work visas, you usually have to be skilled. Um, for employment-based green cards, there is an unskilled option um, based on people with trades or, or that have experience, but you have to have like a job offer in place where Canada seems to provide you sort of a, a step-by-step -step guide for people that are skilled and unskilled, which makes it easier for people to get to, to move. Definitely. As if you've been reading some news, uh, you know, a lot of people from uh, who are uh, displaced uh, who are on the refugee category, maybe in uh, Middle East, Syria, Jordan, Lebanese, uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, pretty much all over the world, wherever there's some political instability. Uh, when people leave their homes, I think uh, 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 they they have Canada in their mind. You know, I think uh, they, if they can, if they can reach Canada somehow, uh, they they want to uh, you know they want they want to try to come to Canada maybe get refugees so I think about a few years ago uh, you know a lot of refugees close to about fifty five or seven, sixty thousand plus uh, refugees from uh, from Syria came here they were settled 
uh, settled in from, you know, uh, brought in from there. So, so can Canada is the great uh, beacon of hope for for refugees, uh, and and they they uh, they are they are taking readily in, and people welcome them. You know, they are a good uh, you know fill up for for different labor shortages. So it's it's a great program. Options, absolutely. Yes. That yes. sounds that sounds fantastic. But I think you've answered all the questions that I've had for for a lot of uh, people that I know in Iran have been asking these questions. You know, how do I get to Canada? What is the process? And what if I'm, I want to study there? And you've really helped clarify all these different options that are available for people in Iran that if, you know, if they want to invest or they want to study or whatever the situation is, that they have that opportunity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Next time, next time I look forward to somebody in Iran, I would like to Definitely. talk. Definitely. I would like to talk to these guys. Uh, maybe they're not even in Iran. Maybe they're in the U.S., uh, but they yes. are in, a, in some kind of limbo. Or they may be in a different country, maybe you know, like uh, Europe, maybe somewhere or whatever they're trying to, you know, if they if they want to uh, discuss something, yeah, why not? You know, we can we can uh, listen to listen to their situation and uh, give them factual, uh, you know, advice on what is the right thing to do. Yes, that definitely sounds like a yeah. good plan. We'll do something like that. Absolutely. Let me let me let me say in, uh, something in my language so that I can introduce to people who don't uh, follow in English. And so, those are a Tina Gumashin uh, immigration lawyer in uh, America, uh, Los Angeles, another office. If you have any US immigration, you can't do it. 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 So directly to see you can do it. U.S. immigration problem solve So that's the that, thank you. Thank answer. you. Listen, <laughs> thank uh, you so much. Out. Maybe they can they can follow through. Definitely, and the same for for my clients, for Mr. Amardrat Singh. I'm going to put up some information about yourself so that they can contact you. And a lot of people that are wanting to go to Canada now, especially with it having open doors, they know in, that in, in Farsi. In Farsi, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, my Farsi isn't very fluent, but I'm going to have that put in writing in Farsi so that people can see see that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Good, good. All right, thank you, Tina. Uh, uh, nice uh, having. Uh, you know, I as you as you know, I, you can tell I enjoy uh, taking questions. Uh, this is my yes. job and professions, and uh, on my YouTube there are close to thousand plus videos. Uh, on different topics on, uh, you know, Canada immigration, different categories. And uh, there's nothing in the world I like better than answering questions about Canada immigration. Uh, this is this is the fun thing to do. And uh, my wife and my children say, hey, dad, you don't get bored to talk about immigration. <laughs> so I love it. Uh, and, you know, I if I have a choice to just uh, skip my lunch and dinner and take some calls, I will do that. And that's what I like to do. Fantastic. That's great that people know that. And I'm, I'm going to make sure that my clients all know that they can contact you anytime with any questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.